Hello and welcome to another edition of Trash Arts Tick, episode 8, with myself, Ryan, we got Sam, we got Jackson, and we got a special guest today, Mike Reed. Um, on today's show, we're going to be covering industry, um, and then we're going to have um, the pleasure of interviewing Mike, and uh, Sam will be doing that. And then, finally, with everything that's going on in the world right now, um, we kind of wanted to be a bit optimistic, uh, so we're going to be reviewing our favourite films of the last decade. So without further ado, guys, let's crack on. So unfortunately, a lot of the industry news is dominated by the doom and gloom of the coronavirus. I tried to look for many other things, and there are some things, but the main thing is coronavirus. Now what we're finding now is that a lot of film events have been delayed. It started with um, South by Southwest, the film and music festival in Texas. That was the first to get the chop. A lot of filmmakers, no home to screen their films. And then CinemaCon uh, on Thursday has just been cancelled. CinemaCon is a big old expo that happens in Europe. And because of the shutdown with Europe, they're not, no one wants to screen their films. And then like pretty much like a domino effect, all the films started getting cancelled. So yeah. Quiet Place was first. And then Fast and Furious 9, and these were on top of Peter Rabbit 2. And um, the biggest one, of course, James Bond, which was last week. So you're getting all these constant like delays in these films, which means yeah, there's going to be a crop of films at the end of the year. But the real reason is, is that cinemas are going to be closing, and they know they're closing, and America's doomed. <laughs> that's that's the let's not be you know let's not beat around it. The box office is failing. They're looking every week, and I think we need to start. I've always felt that we need to start reinterpreting how we look at an opening weekend of a film, because a box office opening weekend is borderline irrelevant nowadays. Mm. When you have streaming, or you have, um, well, yeah, with the streaming, you sometimes have that first day sort of films out cinema DVD that kind of experimentation. That will be the future of the box office. So maybe the, the coronavirus will have to take into effect of how we actually view films. We'll see. I'm sure Netflix are very... I'm not to say happy, because no one's happy with no. the coronavirus. <laughs> but I'm sure they're, they're probably thinking we're not delaying any films anytime soon. And of course, that's just films that have been completed. Every studio is now having to evaluate whether they're going to shoot in certain countries. Uh, Mission Impossible was going to shoot in Italy. That's not happening anymore. A lot of money is being pummeled into the UK and the UK is trying to like, trek along and it's all okay, but it's not. The industry will keep going to the UK for now, but whether this can continue, we're going to see a lot of delay on a lot of productions. Hmm. And I don't know if the studios know how to handle that. We shall see. I think in, in our lifetime anyway, there's never been a pandemic as crazy as this no there hasn't and as quick as this and this is the thing you've got Cannes Film Festival they are in an awkward position where they did not put insurance on themselves if a situation like this would occur so they're sort of like we're not going to cancel it despite France saying we're cancelling all big events let's see how that plays out <laughs> and even Tom Hanks got hit with the coronavirus on the set of Baz Luhrmann's Elvis film yeah so yeah anyone anyone you love could die could die. This is the thing. I, I'm reporting on this now. In a few days, we might find out that everyone's dead. Pacino's dead. De Niro's dead. Scorsese's dead. All right, I'm just naming Scorsese's people. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Who knows? And because of this, one particular film has been getting a lot of, like, it's going up in the charts like crazy. And that's the film uh, Contagion. The Steven Soderbergh film from, like, 2011. Good film. Very depressing. Now it feels like a docudrama. So everyone's kind of diving into that. So I tried to find something that wasn't just Corona, death, 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 and cancellations. And Bloomhouse have decided, due to the excess of The Invisible Man, they are going to do another Hammer Horror, well, sorry, not Hammer Horror, Universal Horror with Going With Dracula. I think the reason why I said Hammer Horror there is that Dracula is pretty much in the domain. Anyone can make a Dracula film. It doesn't have to be necessarily a Universal Dracula film. And they've employed um, Karen Kusama. And Karen Kusama did um, The Invitation, which is a fantastic film, most recently Destroyer. So I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of spin they bring to that. On a more local side for us, 
Last weekend was DV Mission, which is a fantastic 48 hour film challenge based in Portsmouth and that kind of opens up to any team to try and make a film the weekend before and the weekend after they have their ceremony. We were very lucky. We, uh, we won Best Actress, Annabella Rich, who was a fantastic actress. She did a great job of our film. And we also got nominated for Best Sound. There were some great films that got some, um, that definitely deserve to win some awards. You can check all that out on their YouTube channel, DV Mission. Again, we'll put the link underneath so people can see it. So, you know, there's a bit of positivity, but mostly death, gloom, and corona. Not the bear. No. The virus. So now we're going to lighten the mood a little bit, and we've got Mike Reed. Um, yeah, guys? So we've got Mike Reed on Trash Arts Talk. How are you doing, Mike? Hi, Sam. Yeah, nice to be here. That's good. That's good. What got you into filmmaking? What, what got me in, well, what got me into it or got me interested um, was, and this is such a corny, <laughs> such a cliched corny kind of answer, um, which you hear a lot of people my sort of age, is basically I, I was the right sort of age to get captured by Star Wars. And <laughs> I know you can see you roll your eyes right now. Right? Like, <laughs> and... Uh, I remember what, one Friday evening at my nan's, I saw uh, The Making of the Empire Strikes Back, and that was the first time I realised that films were made, um, and the kind of work and special effects that went into making a film back then. Um, so that got me interested in making films. Um, I've always been quite creative anyway, I mean, I've, I've done like an arts course and stuff, you know, and when I was younger, I was always into art and designy type stuff, a bit of drama. Um, do you want me to carry on? I can kind of no, keep no, going. I mean, <laughs> it's interesting you that, say that with the whole Star Wars thing, because yeah, I'm not a fan of Star Wars, but that doesn't matter. But there is that. You got, you got, this, thing. this was seventies Star Wars. This was like phenomena. Yeah. This was like just amazing. Well, they know? would say the generation before you, there would be the you know the big kind of blockbuster 80s sort of films like Indiana Jones or The Goonies would be their film that may have got them interested in filmmaking or seeing the other side. For me, personally, for our generation, it's probably Lord of the Rings. Right. Of being able to see something on that big of an epic scale and realising that there is so much craft behind this and it makes you explore it and obviously yeah. the director's cut, they gave you shit tons of DVD extras. So you got to see how all of that was made. So I think it is something that happens with a lot of filmmakers who move towards genre. They seem to be driven as a starting point by having those big, epic films, as they were, you know? Talking about your um, being interested first films, your first film was uh, Crooked Features? First feature, yeah. Yeah, your first feature film. Because I know before that you did a lot of um, like kind of art projects with uh, Clive Tag. Yeah. I know you've done a lot yeah, of like, yeah. features. And, and shorts and, and just kind of like... You know, friends pissing about other camera kind of yeah. stuff, basically. Yeah. But that's the thing. Crooked Features was two thousand and five, wasn't it? Released two thousand and five. Yeah, we shot it two thousand and four, if I remember rightly. Yeah. Well, that would have been um, mini DV as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, it was kind of on the cusp. Um, like DSLR was kind of coming in, but it was really expensive and all the rest of it. Um, you know, thinking about it, if, if, if we'd shot it a year or two later, it probably would have been on DSLR. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a mockumentary, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. So a mockumentary uh, about the porn industry, really, or sort of uh, a very naive view of the porn industry. Um, but that was the whole point. The protagonist is quite a kind of naive uh, young girl. And then what kind of challenges did you find when first making your film? Because I know, like, within... Within the mockumentary format, there are a lot of boundaries that are taken away yeah. and a lot easier for a first time. <clears throat> so, I mean, yeah, it was made, it was a mockumentary for those reasons, to make it simpler to create. Um, but what we soon discovered, because it's quite a big cast, there's probably, with cast and crew, there's probably about a dozen people to manage. Um, and it became, I realised, you know, me and the producer realised quite quickly, it becomes a logistical exercise more than necessarily creative um, when you're in production um, and that's something you don't necessarily realize quite so much when you're doing shorts or when you're just having fun with friends you know you're just kind of like having fun right uh, but when, you, when you're creating something that you hope to get a return on or, or you know you're creating it with a professional mindset the you know the logistics do play a massive role well, that's the thing like 
when it comes down to logistics, one thing that I've always noticed with your filmmaking, I haven't known you for like, I don't know, over 10 years now probably, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, is that you do like to mix the media. And I know yeah. some of it is more of a, the simplicity of trying to tell a story, but I know that you are, because if I'm right, like with a lot of that mixing of media, it is because you've come from art school from the 90s mm. that encouraged a lot of uh, visual mixed media as opposed to just sticking to one format. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's like, it's about, you talked about genre earlier. I mean, you know, I for, for a long time, I would just make science fiction stuff. Um, but I think with the mixed media and the experimental stuff, that is about just breaking down bound boundaries and um, experimenting and seeing what works, see what doesn't work. And then every now and then you bring that back into maybe a more serious piece, you know, more mainstream kind of piece of work or whatever, or a more genre piece, depending what your sort of target demographic is. Well, speaking of two of your more experimental feature films that we were lucky to be able to work on, uh, there was obviously Game in 2012, which was nuts and insane, and I got to act in it. And I have good memories of yeah. that. It's good. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, and just for people listening, that, that was it 2011 we shot that? I think it was 2012. 2012, so, so a good few years ago. Uh, and that basically, this was co-produced with a friend of mine, Clive Tag, and he, we didn't, I mean, he didn't have to persuade me very, it wasn't a, it wasn't difficult for him to persuade me, but it, it was the first film I made where I kind of let myself go a bit in terms of like kit and scheduling and, and to an extent logistics because it was um, all uh, improv on it, you know, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of improv, which I'd never really, it scared me, you know, because it's like, oh my God, it's like I was so used to like having a script and people learning their lines and all the rest of it and you have a shot list and blah, blah, blah. But it was so liberating and so freeing that experience that, you know, no matter what people might think of the finished product, the, the, I got so much out of that process, um, and I've, I've kind of never really gone back. I mean, even today, you know, the phone in my pocket takes more video than my camcorder ever does. You know. Well, that's it. Because the um, after gain, I know that um, the next feature that we actually got to co-produce with you, three AM SMR. Hmm. That was like, if anything, even more into the experimental with yeah, yeah. a collection of people and just being trippy as hell. <laughs> yeah, so and, and, and that, that started out as kind of, uh, I suppose it's like a spiritual um, sequel to Gain. Um, it was originally called Pain. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym was for Pain, but um, and yeah, I, it, it was this, this was more about can you make something feature length in a day? or at least shoot something feature length in a day. Um, and the answer is, yes, you can, but I'm not sure you could make anything that wasn't experimental in a yeah, day, yeah. <laughs> if I'm, if I'm, That's if it, I'm bluntly honest. Continuous shots just following the sounds of movement. For yeah, the and, and, and so, yeah, I mean, the reason it's called 3AM ASMR is uh, it, the genre is ASMR. It's, it's kind of like one of the first feature length ASMR films and it focuses on the sound so there's like a lot of footsteps in it and stuff because that can be a trigger for, uh, uh, for people who get this ASMR thing which is autonomous sensory meridian response which uh, basically is like tingles around the crown of your sort of scalp and stuff when you hear it's certain certain triggers basically mm. um, so we're trying to replicate that um, I mean from the feedback we've got yeah some people get it, some people don't. Um, so I think it, it, it's been mildly successful on that front. Um, I think, you know, if I was to, if I was to do it again, it would probably be a two day shoot if I'm honest. But again, it's like it's live and learn, and you get your rushes, you make something out of it, you know. Yeah, and it kind of pushed you more within to the ASMR because I know um, it's a good opportunity where you get to plug your uh, YouTube li uh, link for ASMR channel. And said you've ASMR, to me, I always like to think that for you, it's an, it is another platform to be experimental. Because yeah. otherwise, it, it can be quite. Yeah, dumb. I mean, I, I did, I've done sort of quite a bit of sound, production sound recording in my time. So, not like, mm. not in a mixing studio, but like live production sound, you know, um, documentary and, and feature stuff. Um, so, I've always had sound, I've always enjoyed sound recording. I find it quite sort of zen in a way. Um, but also, what 
it, with me, it ties into the art in terms of sort of like Dada and surrealism because like my ASMR channel, which is ASMR.show, if you just type that into your browser, you'll end up uh, at my YouTube channel. Um, you know, it, it's an opportunity to just do some crazy stuff, but also some really like, you know, the other day I, I was like counting safety pins for an <laughs> ASMR video, you know, and uh, that's not been published yet, but so I'll see how that one's received. But, but you know, I've done other things like, you know, like uh, cut plastic dolls up and stuff. Um, and okay, sometimes something like that triggers people in the wrong way, yeah. um, but that, I find that quite entertaining as well. And that's where the sort of Dadaism comes in for me. It's like it, it, an art is about creating a response, whether it's positive or negative. And no. to get people to think, you know, and you know, no matter what you think about me cutting a doll up, it is still basically a piece of plastic. Okay, it's like a human figurine shape, but yeah. you're you're projecting your own thoughts onto the video. You don't know what I was thinking when I was cutting that doll doll up. You're thinking it as you're watching it, mm. so it's more a reflection of the viewer than the creator. In that, that's that's how I view it. So when people moan at me, I'm like, well. Whoa, 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 you know, you're projecting your your view of reality onto my videos and it's reflecting back at you. It's nothing to do with me, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, that's the thing, because you, you, do, you do get quite a split opinion on those things, but so did Dadaism, so did Surrealism. Exactly, it's, it's and, and, and I that think that's why that sort of stuff is still around. And, and obviously, you know, like, the advertising industry really picked up on Surrealism because, you know, it's, it's you know, the... Not necessarily the implausible, but the impossible. So, and, it, and it does. There's something. It, it does engage people at a certain level and get them emotional, which then obviously marketeers can sell you on an emotion. You know. No, most definitely. <coughs> Sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you, what would you say would be if someone went here? You go. All the money, Netflix have greenlit you. Everything's in place. What would be that dream project? Well, a, a project. I'd, I'd, tried to get in place uh well because i was i got a load of like youtube strikes on my channel because of like the doll videos and stuff like that. um i started bringing in a lot of puppets and i had this idea i've always loved the muppets i thought they're just brilliant and i thought oh, wouldn't it be great if if there was like almost like a reboot of the muppet show but and it's still kind of a, a variety show like the muppets was but the variety acts are all asmr artists so you have puppets doing asmr or, you know, you get real-life ASMR artists in, you know, like Heather Feather or something, or all that kind of, all those crazy people. Um, they're not crazy, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, you know, um, and, and just have, have it, it, just imagine the Muppet Show, but but everyone's doing ASMR acts on it, or the, that's the majority. And I, I think that, at the moment, that would be my dream project. That would be just, like, really fascinating to, to create, I think. No, it would be pretty cool, and like I said, it explores your interest in sound, and now, because you have been pushing more with puppets, I know we've done a couple of puppet shoots, <laughs> and there is something very, very different about working with puppets, I don't know what it is, it's that personality within something that's not real, it's, it's a strange, it's a strange feeling. Well, as, as I find, like as an introvert, I, I don't, I'm not keen on being on camera, but as a puppet, I find I can be quite expressive. Um, mm. Although where it can fall down is when you're, if, if if I'm like in my sort of YouTube studio, it's basically just me and a camera, and it can still be quite difficult to do everything at once and perform. No, I can imagine. Um, you know, and obviously you have technical issues with filming puppets. Um, you know, just about you know you don't want the human appearing in frame, all that kind of stuff. You know. Well, local. If anyone's local to us and wants to get involved with puppets, leave us a comment. We'll hook you up. Because like you said. To be able to create those things, you want more people who want to be able to get involved. Yeah, in I mean, if there's any like people desperate to be a puppet performer, then get in touch. That reminds me as well, before I go on to our last question, just, just briefly discuss that, about that kind of work in this community. Because you and me and work each for a long time. And for a long time, you've also been doing film maker. Yeah, yeah. Going around and interviewing different filmmakers and, <clears throat> and getting to know the like, indie community a bit better. And I know that you're planning to do more of that as well. So again, if people want to get involved with that, I suppose they can get in touch with us or get in touch with you directly. Yeah, so I've got a URL, uh, filmraker.uk, that will redirect you to the YouTube channel for that. Um, I did, I think the first season, 
three or four years ago and we did some then live pop-ups and then yeah this year I'm sort of slowly organizing just kind of ad hoc really not so not much of a se- not so much of a season but more like one-offs um, yeah and just like I like caught up with you again didn't I yeah, so, yeah. so we, we've got like the five-year gap of, of mm. Sam five years ago versus Sam like this year and stuff <laughs> it's quite interesting to compare uh, but yeah so yeah I, I'm always up for interview. I, I mean, I prefer to do uh, interviews in the same room rather than over Skype or anything. Um, but if anyone's up for that, then yeah, get in touch, definitely. Yep, local guys, get in touch. And final question, bringing it back down to earth, you've got no money, but what do you want to do next? What are you doing next? Um, well, I'm, I'm kind of getting back to my roots on uh, the YouTube ASMR stuff because, I mean, the... ASMR.show channel um, started off as a, a kind of a five-year plan, a five-year experiment, and I'm about four years and three months through it. Okay. I've kind of got the rest of this year to... Well, I was saying, I was saying to Jackson earlier, I want to try and get to 10,000 subscribers this year. I think that would be my benchmark for how then seriously I take it beyond this year. Um, because at 10,000 subscribers, you can start booking time at the YouTube studios yeah. in London, which I think would be quite useful. Well, that's the thing. They give you so many extra kind of points if you do as you're told on YouTube. And yeah. I, I, do, I mean, I do wonder if some of my older videos leave a bit of a black mark on my channel. I mean, I, I just see them as just like harmless fun. They're a bit satirical. There's, they've got sound recording and ASMR at their heart, or I like to think they have. Um, but I guess that... The ones I'm doing now, I'm, I'm trying to be more mindful of of the relaxation side of it and less sort of like satirical and more like still a bit absurd. Like I say, like counting counting um, safety pins is kind of ridiculous, but that's why I did it. Uh, <laughs> you know, and um, yeah, just I guess reining myself back a little bit and... Um, just I suppose trying to give the audience more of what they expect and then maybe once the audience is built up then maybe start reintroducing you know oh you know Barbie in a sellotape dress type thing you know <laughs> well that's the thing and if you really want to check out what you're doing we're going to put the links down below I don't know why I'm doing that with my hands here and I'll see anything <laughs> but yeah we'll put the links down below and as always let the audience decide Thank yeah. you for joining us, Mike. It's been, it's a, been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, it was all cool. And uh, back to Ryan. So now, guys, we want to talk about um, our favourite films of the last decade. The reason we wanted to do this, kind of a little bit of a nostalgia piece, um, obviously with everything going on in the world, um, we wanted to lighten it up. Um, so, yeah, for me personally, I'll kick things off. Yeah, yeah, go away. I love go away. Go away. <laughs> kick off. Sorry, kick off. Get no, out. Man. Just you, you know, get an opinion. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was gonna. I, I kind of had a few that I, I really loved throughout the last decade. And whenever me and Sam were talking about this beforehand, he was dead certain I was gonna pick Inception. Yeah. And I pretty much was about to. Um, but then I thought, actually, what film have I watched the most over the last sort of, well, within the the 10 year period whenever it came out um, the most and it was actually Django Unchained and I absolutely love that film um, I think it was the first uh, uh, well ever since Inglorious Bastards it was the first Tarantino film that really got me into Tarantino and I just love the whole kind of way it plays off um, yeah I, I absolutely love that film it's interesting that was your first Tarantino <laughs> film um, I mean well Inglorious I mean, I'd seen but yeah. I wasn't Massive. It was what when Inglorious came out. I think I was seventeen, so I wasn't as big into my film directors. Yeah, yeah. So I love Scorsese stuff. I'd always love Scorsese stuff. Um, but yeah, I'd never really been aware of any other real like top notch directors. So that's well, kind of what exposed me. Tarantino, like to to some people, is almost again kind of like what I was discussing with Mike about the generational thing. Right. So for me, Tarantino, I saw Pulp Fiction when I was 13, but the film that really got me into him was Kill Bill when it came out in 2003. Whereas other people would be Reservoir Dogs, and now for the newer generation, it could, well, I doubt many young people are running to the cinema to see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but it could be. Yeah. And I think it's down to the fact that he's got that whole 10 films. It's always in stages for him. Because Django is one of his biggest successes. Yeah. Commercially... Oh, yeah. 
critically. I mean, he won. Did he win the Oscar for best original screenplay for Django? Because I know Christoph Waltz won the actor again. Yeah. But I'm pretty sure he won screenplay as well. I'd have to check that out. Because J- Django Cannot confirm. It's like an exploitation film in some regards. It's like those seventies black exploitation films, but with Tarantino's own edge on it, I guess. Is, is there is there any particular scene that stands out? Because I mean, I can think of a scene that stands out for me in that film that it's instant. You know, the, the kind of the tension when they're at the table. Yeah. Before you like. Oh, I love that know. bit. That, and, when... and, but but the whole lead up to that, I was on on the edge of my seat thinking. What's going to happen? I think and it's like, holy crap. The pacing with Tarantino is brilliant. Yeah. I'll probably touch on that a bit more in a second. But no, to answer your question, like that scene's fantastic. Mm. And even the whole improvisation <clears throat> from DiCaprio, whenever he slams his hand down, he actually cuts it in real yeah. life. And he just continued with it. But I think one of my favourite scenes is um, after they go and um, I think Django kills the three brothers and then they're like camping or they're, they've disguised themselves as camping out in this field somewhere and the, the Ku Klux Klan guys turn up and there's that whole debate between them whenever they're talking about the sheets. It's like and the, the guy's wife cut the holes in the sheet. I can't see anything out of it. It's just that whole yeah. bit there it's, was... Yeah, it's, it's just bizarre, isn't it? The, the, kind of, the whole compare and contrast, the comedy and the horror. You know, the, sort of the, yeah, it's just like two opposing... Because, like I say, the, the the KKK bit is almost like ridiculous. It's farcical. It? It's just like yeah, farcical. And then you go from that to like real kind of like holy crap. But never at one moment do you think you become consciously aware that oh, this is really farce. You kind of you still are believing it. It's like yeah, I can imagine people being like yeah. that. There's a realism to it. It's yeah, not just yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. let's kill, let's kill it. You see like almost behind the curtain as to what yeah. they could be like just as normal. Well. I wouldn't say normal people, but just as people, like everyday people. Um, yeah, but, but like with um, Tarantino and his pacing, again, with Django this, and many of other like other Tarantino films, probably The Hateful Eight is one which is fantastic for pacing. Um, that, that tension mm. where it's just created from minimal amounts of dialogue and just a few glances and... You know, shots being held in certain positions for longer than what they probably should be to make you feel uneasy, and I just absolutely thought it was a great set piece. And the reason that I've watched it so many times is because, yeah, it's like what a two and a half hour film, but never do you kind of feel like you're losing interest within it. I suppose it it just goes really nicely. It is quite a fast paced film. it's an interesting one when you compare it with the way that it depicts um, like racism and the KKK in particular. In some ways it kind of, like, I mean Spike Lee would hate the comparison, but it does have some similarities to Black Klansmen. Right. In the way that Black Klansmen, the, the Ku Klux Klan are idiots. They're like complete idiots. They're, 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 they're stupid and their ideology makes no sense. And then the, the, um, the main guy played by Denzel Washington's son he's cool as hell and some I, I remember when I watched this people they were like oh it's a bit stereotypical with white people and I was like what does that even matter and I think Tarantino does a similar thing um, and he's very liberal with how you know with the N words in particular in that film he's yeah, quite yeah. expressive I mean what's his name um, Don is it Don Johnson who, who looks like the KFC guy the colonel in, yeah. in the film he's very liberal with it you know but then that's the funny thing I, me- I remember I saw a meme from that film this week and it's DiCaprio, and he was struggling with the scene because of all the swearing and all of the N-words and fuck and motherfucker and all that. And I, again, this might not be true, but Samuel L. Jackson turned around and went, this is, this is a motherfucking Tuesday to us. <laughs> so, you know. And I always like that Samuel L. Jackson's always said about Tarantino's use of the N-word and the swearing and the taking on black culture to some degree as him being like one of his daughter's white friends who just loves black culture, you know, that it's harmless in some respect. You know there's a respect thing there. Yeah. Especially with Django. Django definitely shows that he has a lot of respect by putting that revenge kind of exploitation element of having that hero figure in Den... Not Denzel. In, uh, Jamie Lee... Uh, Jamie, Jamie Fox. Jamie Fox, yeah. <laughs> Jamie Lee. <laughs> That'd be a different type of Django Unchained. I thought you were going to say Jamie Lee Curtis. I don't know if you know, um, but Django is a famous film franchise with um, 
want to say his name right, but Jesse Franco, Spanish um, actor and director. And in the 70s, 80s, Django was a whole franchise of exploitation westerns. That's why there was a brief cameo from Django. At, they're at the bar and they talk to each other, the old Django and the new ah. Django. Because obviously Tarantino has a very liberal use of stealing. He likes to steal. He steals Enrico Mario Coney's films or he gets into the score room or he steals complete and utter whole entire set pieces and puts them in his own craft. Yeah. And that's why I always thought it was weird when he called it Django Unchained. It's like, you have sort of just stolen the title from a completely <laughs> different franchise, but it's got his reasons, I guess. But it works. And if it works, don't change it. Well, we can only hope. <laughs> Jack, what about yourself? Uh... I thought for a while about it, um, but I, I think in the end, the film that uh, impacted me most over the last 10 years was Mother. Um, it's one that's really stuck with me. I only watched it the once, um, but I felt like I only really needed to watch it once. Uh, I will watch it again at some point, so I do think it's worth a rewatch, but it's very, very heavy. It's a very... Uh, so much... Uh, I, I mean, it, it. The whole the whole film makes you feel frustrated from the very very beginning it, it pushes you emotionally in certain directions and, and makes you um makes you identify very heavily with uh, jennifer lawrence's character um and that's uh, it, i mean altogether it's, it's very very difficult to sum up because obviously it's a it's a it's an analogy for environmental uh it, the, the environmental crisis that's coming it's it's a sort of a look at a god and mother nature and the relationship between those ideas um, and uh, where sort of humans fit in this world and what, you know, uh, how we've treated the world specifically. Um, so I don't want to say too much because it's so, yeah, yeah. it'll give it away very, <laughs> very easily. But like it, it really, uh, there's so much to think about and discuss. I remember when we when we walked away from the cinema from oh, seeing yeah. it, we were discussing it for hours afterwards, trying to work out what every single part of it was. Um, and I mean, I love Darren Aronofsky's work anyway, um, but I really feel like this is, I think Mother is his strongest film. Um, I know that's quite quite a, a big statement to make uh, with Black Swan and that in, its, in his past, but... Yeah, it's a weird one, Mother, isn't it? Because he wrote it, like, as he said, it was like taking lots of shots. Because he just mm. wrote it in one night. Because he just had all this fucking anger towards the environment and everything that's happening. And he just sat and wrote the scripts. And he's Dan Alvosky, so fortunately the famous people in the money were there to just go with that <laughs> mad rush of an idea. And if you remember correctly, um, Paramount marketed it terribly. Yeah, the marketing was, was so it, bad. They made it look like a horror film, and it was not. Yeah, horror yeah film. I remember the trailers. Very much an art house, um, a metaphorical film, really. I don't think allegorical, would, almost. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I would put it into. I mean, it was horrific, no doubt about it. But I wouldn't necessarily put it into the, the horror category again. No. Um, Psychological. No, no, it's not. It's not even psychological. It is much more about the bigger story that it, it's depicting within it. It's you know this. It's set within this house, but this house is is the world, or even the universe as we know it, or even sort of an ephemeral uh, recreation of of wherever God and Mother Nature coincide. <laughs> um, it's it's a very uh, yeah, there's a lot to it because the main character um, uh, played by Jennifer Lawrence is obviously by the end you realise is supposed to be Mother Nature, um, and the uh, poet her, her husband who is played by I can't Javier remember. and Javier hey, Bardem yeah, that's it, yeah. There, there you go um, <laughs> he uh, he is obviously supposed to be God and then he, uh, he essentially without giving too much away he continuously invites people. Uh, into the house, um, uh, which just more and more uh, they they wind they wind uh, Jennifer Lawrence's character up, uh, and just do the things that they're not supposed to do, and really fuck the house up, um, and destroy everything, and uh, yeah, no no film has ever made me feel like that. There's no film that I've been sat in the cinema on the edge of my seat, clenching my fists in yeah, frustration. frustration. Yeah, I, I mean, and there are moments, again, though, that, that, that you are scared for uh, certain characters. There's things that are so shocking and horrific you will never, ever forget. 
Uh, you'll never forget what you've seen in that film. It's Jack still has nightmares. I do, I do. <laughs> no, but it, it, it's it, it's just a it's a, a piece of poetry and film, really. I think um, I think I would recommend it to anyone to watch. It's not an easy watch. It's not a light-hearted, you know, sit down with your partner and and watch something nice <laughs> or anything. Yeah, I yeah. would not watch it with your children or. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, just sit down and watch it at some point though, because it will uh, it will affect you. Sam. So um, one of my favourite films the last ten years was Under the Skin, which was directed by Jonathan um, Glazer in I believe 2013, 2014. And the main reason, like, I just I'm a big fan of like pushing with surrealism, and I, I find it's really hard to do surrealism in uh, modern cinema. And what I love about Under the Skin is it mixes surrealism, but it also mixes grounded filmmaking, as well as horror elements, as well as sci-fi elements. Because if you strip the story back, it could very easily just be Species. And Species, if anyone remembers, is an awful film from the 90s, which focuses on such a big story. There's the alien running around, and she's trying to harvest all these men, and they go for the sexy element, all that kind of stuff. And what I love about Under the Skin is it strips it back to what humanity is in itself. She is an alien who's come to this planet who is there to harvest, but because she decides to sort of divert away from that, seeing some kind of, well again, seeing humanity, seeing it in people that she, she didn't expect, she goes off on her own journey and then realizes how shitty and dark humanity can be. And the way that Jonathan Glazer directed it, it's just so, you wouldn't ever visualise a film like that. For one, it's set in Scotland. <laughs> Scotland is not your usual place to see Scarlett Johansson wandering around as an alien. And the fact that they shot a lot of the scenes with an almost candid camera, mm. GoPro sort of vibe, like the bit where they're walking through this um, supermarket, and she's, it's just it's a nice low shot, and you just know that they're just filming, that it doesn't matter. Or she stops the car and talks to people, and... Some of those people, you know, they don't have a clue who she is. They don't know she's Scarlett Johansson in that moment. And for doing something that's so focused on someone being an alien, it makes a lot of sense to go with that approach, to remove the celebrity of who she is and not be like, oh, by the way, we're filming this for camera and all this kind of stuff, rather than just being like, she's no character. You get an organic reaction. Yeah, I, I remember like there was a meme around the time of Scarlett Johansson falling over. And everyone put her in loads of different pictures of loads of different pictures. No one knew what it was, but it was in Scotland. And that meme is actually just a still from the film. But uh, they must have just saw her walking in the street and thought, oh, look, look she fell over. <laughs> Despite the fact it's a scene in the film. Because the cameras aren't, you know, they, they made it so secretive in that response. But then when they took, when you get to the moments with the harvesting, the artistry really pours out. And it's the, the, the imagery stays with you forever. You ain't ever going to forget that imagery. Some of those shots of them sinking into the abyss. And, oh, it's just insane. Plus a score by uh, Mika, uh, Micah Levy is stunning. There is, you are rarely going to hear something so in coordinates with the film, but you can also just take it away and I can hear that beat. And I hear it now and then and I always think something bad's going to happen. Because it's this, there's this perfect stalker element to the music. Because with the harvesting, she has to stalk, she has to hunt, she has to find those who are perfect to, to harvest, essentially. And the score just allows you to just let her face just walk, and do, or, do, or just driving around and just staring out at people. I'm a big fan of just sometimes taking away the need to have dialogue to fill the space. Yeah. And let the actors just stare at things, because you know what their mind's at. And I think that's what Underskin does so well. Because she's an alien observing life, but then now and then interacting. She is remarkable at just stepping back and looking at things. There's, yeah, there's so many scenes that are like chaotic, beautiful, but sad paintings. That's how I feel about that film. Everything is just, it's miserable and really kind of tough, but it's almost painting-esque, the way that the composure of the shots and stuff is mental. Would you say it's um, got an element of improvisation to it? Um, it's hard to say because I feel like there must have been. I know the film took seven years to shoot. Crikey. And they had to keep going back to it. No one ever thought it was ever going to be released. And I, I feel like it feels like a film where bits are on the spot moments to yeah. get that naturalism. 
and it could be improvised, but it is based on a book. Ah, uh, right. So okay. I wonder how much of it would have been scripted in that respect. And last but not least, Mike? Um, yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, 10 years is a, quite a few years. I had to look, book, look back through all my ratings in IMDb, but I, uh, I've selected um, a film uh, released in 2011 called God Bless America, uh, directed by, I Bob, can't Bob, say, Bob yeah, Goldfrey. Yeah, so the guy out of Police Academy, he kind of, it's a bit like a, Tasmanian Devil type, you know. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what I always picture him as, basically, the guy at the police academy. Anyway, but he directed this film, and yeah. So and it's about kind of like a middle aged guy who gets uh, a, um, what's it, like a fatal diagnosis. So he kind of decides to go a bit mad, and he, he kind of like picks up a young girl on the way. Well, sounds a bit seedy, actually, doesn't it? But, um, <laughs> um, and she kind of encourages him to. to in his killing spree and stuff, and they're, they're, they're sort of targeting celebrity culture and stuff. Um, it kind of ties into shows like The X Factor and how they exploit um, people and, and and kind of people with, I guess, disabilities, whether it's mental or physical. Um, and it just culminates with this end scene and stuff, and it's... It's difficult to explain. It's it's multi layered and it, it kind of sort of it's a bit of a predictable twist. It does have a twist, um, and it's you know, I, have you guys seen it? I haven't. I have. Yeah. I mean, it's a while. It's a while ago since I've seen it, but I, it, but the, the tone of it just just I just love it because it's just like it's kind of like black humor, and it you know killing kids and stuff you know it's just like it's just great you know. <laughs> just your everyday thing <laughs> run of the mill you know I mean, it's, I mean you know it's like I probably haven't really explained it very well but um, it's what, what genre would you say it was Sam it's sort of well, it's, it's borderline the kind of it's borderline road movie in respect to yeah, the yeah, I guess, yeah. kind of thing yeah but it's got the kind of for, again for, to me I suppose an element of it it has got a certain tension in it throughout as well and it's got that whole thing of like you know middle-aged man and like a teenage girl sort of mm. it's a bit like uh? oh, it's a bit like <laughs> but yeah and, and like the and like the you know the guy is quite quite like unremarkable in terms of like what he looks like and stuff but then the things they do and like the is the cinema scene that, that, that where they like someone's noisy so they shoot them or whatever oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love all that. It's just like it, 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 I suppose it brings out the things you wish you, well, maybe not wish you could do, but you know, your 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 own dark place. You think, oh, your yeah. inner demons, you know, played out in the screen. <laughs> not not anything you would actually do, yeah. but you kind of might fantasize about doing. You know, <laughs> maybe <laughs> I'm never going to the cinema with you. <laughs> well, if you do, just be quiet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> never buy popcorn again. <laughs> Munching. <laughs> That's the thing with that film, it's, it's very much um, ahead of its time in regards, because what, like 2010, 2011? 2011, I think it was released, yeah. And yeah, it, cause it, it picks up on all those things that we all hate about modern society, like the idea of an influencer or the idea of celebrity or the idea of, uh, yeah, just those general irritations and just going for such a violent reaction. In some ways, it reminded me of um, that John Waters film, Cec uh, Cecil Would Be Demented. Yeah, I mean, I think there's lots of different. I mean, I wouldn't say it's like particularly original in terms of plot or anything, but it brings together a lot of like bits of different films, I guess, and it's kind of all in one place, which mm. is why I like it. I think he does that a lot because I've seen a few other Bob uh, Goldthwait films, and he always knows how to give you a story where you're like, I've seen this story before, but he goes somewhere else with it. Me and Jack yeah, saw yeah. this film called Willow Creek. I don't know if you remember the Bigfoot film. But one oh, shot is like just inside a tent and you know the things on the other side and it's like 20 minutes long and again it's not the most original story but that particular scene with that approach you feel that fear and it's really hard to be scared of Bigfoot especially when you don't see it and it's all just the sound and that atmosphere and I think he just has a, he's clearly got a lot of love for film and just finds different yeah. ways of doing it he could probably again with his with his alternative comedy yeah yeah it's and yeah, I mean, like I said, I think I saw that film before I knew it was directed by him, and, and like when I found out, I was like, oh, that's really like, you know, surprising, I guess. Mm. But yeah, and I really enjoyed that film, and, and like I say, it's like looking through my kind of 
IMDb ratings, I was like, oh yeah, okay, I rated that quite high, and it's that was the first one I came to from the last decade that um, I'd rated highly. Nice. Thanks, Mike. So, guys, we hope you enjoyed the show today. Um, if you can give us a like, uh, please do. If you can give us a subscribe. Hit the off. bell. <laughs> hit the bell. <laughs> yeah, hit the bell. And um, if you have any kind of uh, films that you want us to review, give us a comment. Um, other than that, thanks for listening. Trash Arts Tick out. Bye.